What is up, everybody? Welcome back to the Two Stripes Podcast, the podcast that focuses on everything college football. My name is Colton Denning, and I am your host. Today is Wednesday, February 22nd. It's a beautiful day here in Boulder, Colorado. Hope every one of you is having a great day whenever you're listening to this and want to thank you for listening to today's show. As always, if you like the show and want to support the show, which I highly encourage, you can do so by searching Two Stripes Podcast on iTunes, leaving a review, uh, leaving comments, concerns, anything you want to do to give feedback to me in this show is greatly appreciated and it helps out a ton. You can also go to soundcloud.com slash two stripes pod and listen, download from there. All that good stuff. Go through the archives and check out all the Two Stripes podcast episodes from this offseason. So we might as well just get right into today's show. Last night, I had the opportunity to speak with Billy Gomilla, the managing editor of AndTheValleyShook.com, SB Nation's LSU site. And I thought it was a very interesting discussion. We talked a lot about the transition from Les Miles to Ed Orgeron and some of the differences between how the two of them run their program, specifically when it comes to in-state recruiting and fending off Alabama for some of the top in-state kids and needing to do a better job in the 2018 class than they did in this previous class of keeping those top kids away from the Crimson Tide. Billy also shed some light on the differences between Miles selling the program as a way to get to the NFL and Orgeron more so selling it now towards come play for Louisiana and come play for LSU. So I think you guys will find that pretty interesting and the differences in philosophy between the old head coach, Les Miles, and the new one, Ed Orgeron. And then we talked on-field stuff. LSU hired Matt Canada as offensive coordinator away from Pitt. So Billy talked about some of the expectations for him in his first season and some of the creative things that he can do and whether his hiring makes running back Darius Geis one of the favorites, if not the favorite, for the Heisman Trophy in 2017. And then finally, we switched over and talked about the defense, and Billy gave his thoughts on whether or not LSU will be fine after losing so much defensive talent to the NFL and how defensive coordinator Dave Aranda is going to be able to fill some of those key gaps that they now have after losing so much talent from last season's defense. So we might as well get right into it. Here is Billy Gomilla of AndTheValleyShook.com. Joining me right now on the Two Stripes podcast, my guest, the managing editor of And The Valley Shook, Billy Gomilla. Billy, And The Valley Shook does such a great job of, of covering football and everything that happens at LSU in a place that big, but you guys do not miss a beat. Right now, it is the start of college baseball season. What is it like shifting like straight from signing day just right into covering a big-name baseball program? Not a lot of other schools or college football fans do that well from a, a, a blog management standpoint it's great because you've got the content plus especially um our basketball team kind of sucks so that makes it uh fun but we you know, we, have, we have staff who are probably arguably bigger uh you know baseball fans than they are football fans and you know they wait they wait for baseball season to start and and all that thing, and and that's it, it, it's easy to do when you have LSU's baseball's tradition, you know, of, of competing for national championships and and having a great home atmosphere and, and, and all those things, and it, it, it's a lot of fun. Baseball season's a great time. Well, speaking of home atmospheres and great fans, LSU obviously known uh, to to have both of those, especially for their home game. So we might as well just jump right into football. Signing day was. Earlier this month, LSU finishes seventh in the 24-7 composite ratings. So I want to get your thoughts on what LSU did as a class. They brought in one five-star kid, 15 four-stars, and eight three-stars, nine from Louisiana. And in particular, something that I found pretty interesting was the way that they recruited Louisiana this year and the way that particularly Alabama was able to come in and get some of the top kids. I think it was three of the top five kids. Usually that's... That's an area where LSU dominates. In 2016, they signed nine of the top 10 kids in the state, seven of the top 10 in 2015. 
What was the difference this year? And is that just a one year blip? Was that kind of a product of what happened with Les Miles and the shift to the new coaching staff? What can we expect going forward with LSU recruiting the state of Louisiana? Well, I know that's going to be a big point of emphasis for, for Ed Ogeron and with his, uh, his kind of his, his continuing, you know, reorganization of the LSU football program into more of what he wants as opposed to exactly what Les Miles wants. And, and that it, it was a number of things, you know, Alabama right now is just a different level recruiting wise that they're kind of that, that Hollywood program, you know, almost the way Notre Dame was in, in, in the sixties and seventies, where it, if they call a kid's going to listen. I mean, there was a kid, uh, Chris Allen, one of the top kids in the state linebacker from, from Baton Rouge plays for a former LSU quarterback, huge, you know, big need, you know, good player could, could have had a chance to come here to, to LSU and play quickly because he plays a position that L, that was a big priority for LSU in recruiting this year. And, and while they were able to re, to re, replace him with some pretty good prospects in, in Tyler Taylor and Grant Phillips, he was a big loss partially because he looked at it as, well, if Alabama wants to recruit me, I have to, I can't pass on that opportunity. They're just at that level where it's like, oh, well, Alabama wants me. Well, I got to think about that then. And, uh, you know, Phil Darian Mathis, the, you know, the other, the other really prime kid that LSU had a really good shot at, big defensive lineman at a Monroe. And that's also been an area of the state where just some relationships with some coaches, uh, you know, at the high school level eroded over the years. You had, uh, you know, one legend, Don Chow's at West Monroe, which is, uh, you know, the, the, the big, the big, uh, you know, large public school powerhouse in the states produced guys like you know Andrew Whitworth, of course, who played for the Bengals, plays for the Bengals up there. I'm sure you, you folks in Ohio know him real well. You know, tons of great players have come out of there over the years, and it, and it really kind of began with with when he retired. Cam Robinson from uh, from that program and ended up at Alabama instead of LSU, and that kind of opened up the floodgates for him a little bit. And it, it's it's one of those things that Ed Ogeron's definitely prioritizing. Because I don't know that you can set out to say we're going to beat Alabama and, and, and take take the number one ranking back from them in one year. But I do think it's attainable to say, you know what, if they're going to sign a number one class, it's not going to be with with Louisiana kids and and try to cut them off there and make that be kind of your first step. And I think that's going to be a big priority for the for for the uh, the class of of 2018. It's not. It's kind of going to be similar to 2017, where it's not. It's not the classes that Louisiana has produced in, in the past in terms of numbers, you know. And even last year, there were kids that were top ten prospects in the state of Louisiana. That I mean, for sure, there was at least one. I think a safety who ended up signing with Florida that LSU didn't even offer, and another couple that. LSU kind of pursued, but but weren't a, a big priority, or or maybe got a scholarship offer late when some other out of state kids turned them down. Things like that. It it may shape up to be another year like that. But the top top guys that LSU is absolutely going to be competing with Alabama for, they have got to make sure they get this year. Speaking of which, for the top ten kids in that 2018 class committed to LSU right now. I know that the Tigers just had their boys from the boot event over the weekend where all the in-state prospects come in for, I, I believe, a camp. How is that shaping up? Does it look like, at least as of right now, that they're going to be kind of back into position to compete with Alabama and get those top kids in? Like, I, I was doing some research, and what the hell is Kansas doing having – two kids committed from <laughs> from Louisiana right now, two top 10 kids. I'd imagine that that probably won't stick, but why is Kansas in there? Well, some of them have already started uh, backing out of it. it. It's it's kind of a long story. And in, in the process of kind of reshaping this class, Ogeron let go of uh, Jabbar Jaluk, who was LSU's running backs coach, who was a New Orleans guy, was kind of the, uh, the successor to Frank Wilson, who was LSU's recruiting coordinator under Les Miles for a long time. Uh, now the head coach at, at Texas San Antonio, doing a great job there, you know, really kind of making a name for himself. Well, Ogeron decided to, to part ways with Jaluk, and that didn't really sit real well with a lot of the New Orleans head coaches. The, the, the situation's kind of been smoothed over a little bit. The guy who was hired to replace Jaluk as the New, the New Orleans recruiter is Mickey Joseph, who was a quarterback at 
uh, Archbishop Shaw, one of the, the private school powers back in, in the 80s and then went on and played for Tom Osborne at Nebraska in the late 80s and early 90s. And, and you know, a guy who's very much a known commodity in, in the city of New Orleans. And so that's going to help. And right out the shoot, a lot of these guys that are uh, that committed to Kansas really quickly. And, and the story there is um, Tony Hull, who is, I believe, Kansas's running backs coach, is a former New Orleans head coach. David Beatty, the head coach there. Uh, has some ties to Louisiana as well. They they've been slowly picking off, you know, kids that might have gone to ULL or or Louisiana Tech or Tulane schools like that. To uh, Kansas has been able to pull, and so they they made their their big play with these kids. And you know, Tony Hull got himself a nice little promotion and a raise out of it. We'll see. Uh, I, I'm quite certain it's not going to hold up. One of them, I know one of them. I think a defensive tackle who is not really high rated now, but we think is going to probably be very highly rated by the time the, the whole process is done. Uh, almost immediately, as soon as LSU offered, flipped his commitment from Kansas to LSU. And <laughs> I know one of them, Devontae Jason, who's a wide receiver, uh, who I believe is the top receiver in the state. If he's not, he's maybe number two. But he's everybody wants that kid. That kid's not going to Kansas. And, and, and LSU is certainly going to make their, their, their push for him. And they've already... Uh, they they pulled him in for the for the boys from the boo, which is not really a camp. It's more just kind of a meet and greet, kind of a social event. And this year, well, one thing that was different with from, with uh, Ed Ogeron compared to Les Miles is Ogeron really opened it up to a lot more kids, to their families, to their coaches, to you know even just teammates who felt like coming. Um, whereas before, they kind of focused, they narrowed their focus to to mostly just the top players of the state. And, and while I understand that, that, that thought process in, in Ogeron's case with just kind of the way things have been going, it's kind of his way of making a show of force and a, a statement that, look, if you're a Louisiana kid, we want you here. And that's something that, you know, it, it, it could go, hopefully will go a long way towards repairing those relationships and, and getting an LSU back on top for the kids that they really want within the state. I'm glad you brought up one of those differences between uh, Les Miles and Ed Orgeron because, and if any of you guys listening haven't checked out, uh, Bruce Feldman from Fox Sports had an excellent piece that I believe went up uh, last week about spending 72 hours around the LSU facility and Ed Orgeron around signing day. Of course, uh, Bruce wrote the Meat Market book back when Orgeron was the coach at Ole Miss. If you haven't read that, you should definitely check it out. It's worth your time. But there was an anecdote pretty early in the story that I thought was interesting that mentioned how on the first floor of the football facility under Miles that it was filled with a bunch of pictures of LSU players that ended up making it into the NFL. And when Orgeron took over, he replaced it with photos of every LSU conference and national title team. And then one of the quotes in there that Feldman got from somebody within the program basically said that some people think that Miles didn't want to have those pictures up there because of Nick Saban and kind of the things, looking back on that era where Saban was involved, is that one of the big differences between Miles and Orgeron? And is it still kind of awkward, not only inside the program, but for fans as well, to kind of get to this transition of Miles to what Ed Orgeron is as head coach? Well, it's going to take some time because there were there were definitely portions of the fan base that just really couldn't get past uh, Orgeron's record at Ole Miss and, and just viewed it as, well, we should have gotten Jimbo Fisher, we should have gotten Tom Herman, you know, and we settled for Ogeron, and, and the the biggest way to, to flip the script on that will be to, will be for him to win and continue to do a lot of the things that he's been doing because he he really has kind of conducted a master master class in program PR since taking over as the interim coach. And it was a combination that that whole anecdote. I think that's a combination of yeah, there was definitely some insecurity on not just Les Miles but on everybody's part towards Alabama. You know, I don't think there's any secret to that. And if that that bled over into Les Miles thinking, I'm not even really sure I can blame him for it because it's 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 a comparison and it's something that he never – that he was never going to be able to escape ever, ever since – really since the 2011 season and everything that happened, you know, with, with losing that national championship game to Alabama. Um, you know, it just – that it, it just really cast a pall over, over the, the, the last couple of years and it just – it, it became one of those things where I think maybe they got so focused on pushing themselves 
over Alabama that they kind of lost sight of a lot of other things. And, you know, another, another different mindset that Ogeron's bringing to the table, you know, the last couple of years, and, and this is something that, that made sense when they started doing it, but, but eventually kind of flipped the script and started hurting the program was LSU really, really pushed the idea of we're going to put you in the NFL. And it really began with with a, a group of uh, really highly recruited players, guys like Odo Beckham and guys like uh, Jarvis Landry, who everybody knew were going to play pro football. So, you know, a big selling point became, okay, well, we're going to get you there, and we're going to get you there quick. And the whole idea of being here three years and leaving really kind of took root, and it kind of got away from them a little bit and got out of control to the point where – they were losing just about every third year player that that could leave because guys were deciding, you know, sometimes guys who were becoming first year starters in their third year, either as a true junior or a redshirt sophomore, was like, well, this is my money year. This is my year to go pro, and I'm going to go pro as soon as I can. And they couldn't talk a lot of them out. You know, Malachi Dupree is a guy who just left, who, in my opinion, is not at all ready for the NFL, but he was a, a five star recruit. He came here, he, he played quickly, but he never really. You know, uh, like it's one of those gonna be one of those things where he's gonna work out and then they're gonna watch a tape and say, you know, your tape doesn't really reflect your workouts. But he the the plan, quote unquote, for him was to come here and play for three years and go pro. Whereas Ogeron, I think, is pushing more the idea of this is where you want to be. I think that's also what uh, you see at Alabama, which is why they don't lose a ton of their underclassmen. Certainly not to the degree that LSU has lost. They've lost kids that were for the most part, no doubt, first-round picks, but then they still gotten some of those kids back, too, for another year. Guys like O.J. Howard, guys like Jonathan Allen came back for their senior year. And LSU, you know, lost so much to the point that, you know, a couple of years ago they were starting almost an entire team of freshmen and sophomores because that's just who was left at this point. And you saw them lose four or five games that year largely the teams that were senior laden. I know Mississippi State that year with Dak Prescott just had a ton of seniors on the offensive and defensive line. It really, really showed up in those games. When you've got 22, 20, you know, 21, 22, 23-year-olds going up against 18, 19-year-olds, you really see that that just mature difference. And, you know, that, that's something that I think Ogeron's trying to to flip the script on. And, you know, look, we want people to be here. And we were, you know, yeah, we want you to 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 to, ha- to have the most success that you could have personally. But L- but it's about LSU. It's not about the NFL. It kind of seemed like too from the outside that not only were they promoting that, but they were promoting that by I think namely with the hire of Cam Cameron as offensive coordinator, especially when it came to some of the quarterback issues. That hey, we're going to run this system that when you get to the NFL, you'll you'll know how to play. And if you're a wide receiver or running back, you're not going to come out of a spread system where you won't be familiar with whoever drafts you, and and you won't be like a Big Twelve school where you're you're running. You know, you're not seeing in college what you'll see in the NFL, and now. Orgeron this offseason hires Matt Canada from Pitt to be the offensive coordinator. Pitt finishes third in offensive S&P Plus this past season, and he really did a lot of creative things with what he had there. What's the expectation for Canada's first year in Baton Rouge, and how is he going to use some of those pieces? Because there's definitely some guys there, and I want to get into Darius Geis in particular. What's the expectation for him in his first season? Oh, well, in Canada's place, uh, you know, the they're going to be expecting big things. There's, there's no doubt about that with his reputation. And, and he was somewhat body that was very, very popular in the fan base as far as like, Oh, that's who we need to go get. We need to get Matt Canada. And when, you know, the Lane Kiffin deal kind of fell through and he got a head coaching job that, and, and it became very, very clear. There's a lot of excitement. So he's, he's be facing some big expectations, especially based on what, on what happened with, Pitt this past year it's going to be really interesting to see because the personnel is very very similar the offenses are not dramatically different but there's little twists and turns to them you know a lot of the things that worked out well for Pitt are things that LSU did this past year but didn't necessarily focus as much particularly the jet sweep you know something that was 
a part of, of, of Canada's offense, the, the tune of, of, you know, eight, nine, 10 snaps a game. And, you know, LSU, you'd see it once or twice and you, you'd see it in almost every game, but again, once or twice, they didn't really fake it a lot. You know, it was just kind of something they did. Whereas with Canada, it's much more of a bigger piece in a way of getting other guys involved. But whereas at Pitt, he had a lot of, you know, fullbacks and tight ends and, and, and bigger guys that, he 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 took advantage of with a lot of things. I mean, they ran jet sweeps to their tight ends and fullbacks in some situations. Even a tackle, I think, a few times. Yeah, and and you know, then another thing that had two great tackles who were probably going to be you know decently high draft picks. So they they really kind of focused on that. Whereas here at LSU, he's going to have a little more speed at wide receiver. They're they're inexperienced, but they're all very very talented. They're all really highly recruited. Thing like that, they do have some some really interesting tight ends, and that was something that. You know, a position that LSU's been been really sorely lacking at the last couple of years. They had a lot of guys who were big blocking types, and you know, the big the big uh, I guess more receiving type tight ends kind of languished a little bit. And some of that was on the quarterback. You know, when when uh, the team made the switch to Danny Atling this year, all of a sudden you saw tight ends getting more involved. And I think it was pretty clear even before Cam Cameron left that the reason tight ends weren't weren't really involved that much was because either they weren't getting open or quarterbacks weren't seeing them. Whereas Danny Etling started seeing them pretty quickly and started finding them, you know, not, not to necessarily to the tune of, you know, John Mackey type numbers, but, but, you know, solid two, three catches a game, moving the chains thing like things like that. And, you know, this group that they've got coming back, there's a couple of guys that have been sitting on the bench who were recruited as largely, you know, those, those six, five two thirty receiving tight tight ends who kind of languished a little bit because they weren't great blockers. And so now maybe they'll have a chance to, to get involved a little bit more. If it's possible for somebody that rushes for almost 1400 yards to go under the radar, at least outside of like a conference fan base or LSU's fan base, I think that Darius guys has to be that guy. You look at his numbers, almost rushed for 1400 yards, had 15 touchdowns. So over seven and a half yards per carry, over 10 uh, highlight yards per carry. Do people outside of the LSU fan base and the SEC kind of, I don't want to say bubble, but SEC fandom really know how good this guy is? And and is he, I, I, I mean, I know we're in February, but he's got to be maybe the favorite for the Heisman, don't you think? He's going to be up there, I think. And, and, and he, you saw him get a fair amount of postseason love, especially – you know, closing with uh, breaking Leonard Fournette's uh, single game record on the final week of the season in, in a fairly high profile spot against um, against Texas A&M, even having kind of a high profile failure against Florida where he he there was a miscommunication and he took a step the wrong way on what could have been the game winning touchdown and as a result got stopped short. And then he came through with a big, big bowl game, you know, it the defense is kind of the star, but he still put up some numbers in that game and had a couple of, of highlight real plays. And yeah, I expect him to, to be the, you know, one of the, the top gut contenders. He, he's the leading returning rusher in the conference and there's no reason to, to think he won't have a big year again. And, and it, it's funny. He, he did sit, you know, most of the LSU fans expected big things from him, from him as a backup because, well, we had Leonard Fournette and unfortunately that ankle sprain happened and, he was still, when he was right, the best back in the country, in my opinion. But unfortunately, he just was never able to, to stay right. It was the dreaded high ankle sprain, and that's the kind of thing that doesn't really, quote-unquote, go away. It just kind of takes as long as it takes to, to, to heal up. And when you can't stay off of it, which you really can't during football season, it never really quite heals up. So, But I expect him to be to be a first-round pick and, and be a great NFL player. You mentioned how uh, how expectations already for Matt Canada are pretty high. Coming into last season when LSU was able to poach Dave Aranda from Wisconsin, it kind of felt like the same thing, and he was more than able to deliver LSU finishes third in defensive S&P Plus, had, sends another full wave of guys off to the NFL, and you look at – the defense right now, losing guys like Kendall Beckwith, Duke Riley, uh, Devon Gacho, Lewis Neal, Jamal Adams, Tredavious White, Dwayne Thomas, and for the moment, right now at least, Arden Key. Who are the next wave of stars for this defense? Because it's kind of 
felt like for the last decade or so that LSU's just been able to replace whenever they've lost anybody. And do you think that they're going to take a big step back in 2017, or is that talent there to kind of continue that high level defensive play? Oh, I would expect it to to, to continue. I, I don't know if it'll quite be uh, what it was last year, but it'll be pretty darn close. Um, you know, we're waiting to see what Arden Key what happens with the Arden Key situation. No one quite knows exactly what the the story is. Uh, you know, uh, all we know is that it's being kept very very quiet. So, you know, certainly hope hopefully it's nothing you know too uh, too serious for his family and things of that nature. What you know, whatever it is, we hope he gets right. He doesn't really need the spring spring practice. You know, all that would really would really happen is him risk injury. So as, as long as he's back you know, for the summer and for the fall, I think all will be fine there. Um, there you know, there's a lot, there's still a lot of things to be excited for in terms of some young guys, uh, Devin white, who was a, a big running back recruit who shifted to uh, linebacker because he was kind of lost in the shelf back, had a really nice freshman year. Didn't necessarily finish with a ton of tackles, but made a lot of big plays. He had a big sack of, uh, of Lamar Jackson, the Heisman winner in the bowl game showed a real knack for, for blitzing from the inside linebacker spot. He's more of a kind of that stumpy middle linebacker type about, you know, six foot, maybe a little shade under 240 pounds. Uh, in Kendall Beckless spot, Donnie Alexander's a guy who, who's been a special teams player and, and stepped in and, and kind of struggled off right off the, sh- off the, the back when, uh, when Beckless got hurt, but then, Closed out with some really strong games against Texas A&M and Louisville. And so he could maybe be in line as a senior to have kind of a similar year to what Duke Riley did, which was come in and and finally kind of have it all click for him and, and really take advantage of the situation. And then, of course, you know, defensive line has always been a big, big emphasis of recruiting here. It's always been a position that Louisiana has produced a lot of talent in in particular. And so there's plenty of guys that, that, that'll be ready to step into that spot. Plus, you know, a big giant nose tackle that was recruited this year and Tyler Shelvin, who's that big, you know, six two, three hundred and fifty pound type guy who could probably step in and, and, you know, certainly won't start, but will probably play, you know, 15, 20 snaps a game early and, and just help free every, everybody else up. And, yeah, but yeah, this is this is a defense that's still going to be really, really good. They return a lot, including three guys who who have started in the secondary and a couple of you know more five star recruits coming in, and some who who just didn't quite get on the field last year because of who of who was ahead of them. You know, guys like Christian Fulton, who was a a stud recruit and, and didn't redshirt, but mostly just played special teams and should be stepping into either a starting role or or one of the nickel roles right away. Shifting back to the offense real quick, Danny Etling back, Brandon Harris transfers last week or intends to transfer. What's the status of LSU's quarterback situation right now, and how would you expect that to play out as spring practice starts next month? Well, and I, I think with Danny Etling, the writing was on the writing was on the wall for Brandon Harris, and that's why I think you're seeing him transfer. It, it just really wasn't very likely that he was going to overtake Etling, Etling for the uh, the starting job because while Etling wasn't great, he was just so much more consistent game to game once he, he came in in terms of just executing the offense. And, you know, it's funny, in two of LSU's losses, both the Auburn and Florida losses that really came down to the last play, LSU was in position to – win those games because Danny Etling led some pretty gutsy drives in that final minute to get them to the, the spot where they had a shot at winning the game. And and that they kind of got overshadowed because of the way the games ended. I, I think there's a chance that he can maybe have not a great senior year, but a, a solid, you know, workman like senior year kind of in line with what, you know, some of Alabama's quarterbacks have done in the last couple of years, guys like Greg McElroy and, and players like that who weren't necessarily the greatest of players, but you surrounded them with talent and they could distribute the ball the way they needed to do so. And I think recruiting the last couple of years ha- has helped in that there's no quarterback coming in that's seen as the savior the way Brandon Harris was. And that was really a big part of all the quarterback problems LSU's had here is they never had enough depth. They were always having to move from a senior to a freshman or a sophomore. 
they never had that next guy in the pipeline who'd been through the program for a few years. And it's setting up for them to have that with guys like Lindsey Scott, who will probably wind up being this year's backup. Um, you had two quarterbacks in this class, Miles Brennan and Lowell Narcisse, who, you know, both have a lot of talent and Narcisse in particular will be here in the spring and he's coming off a knee injury, but he he'll be a full go and, he, he's going to be, I think it's going to be a clean slate for everybody. I don't imagine anybody overtaking Danny Etling, uh, but it, it's going to be a clean slate with a new offensive coordinator and we'll see what happens. But overall, I think it sets up really, really well for the future in that once Danny Etling's going, we're not going to be transitioning again to a, a second year, a first year player, a second year player. It's going to be either so it's probably going to be somebody like Lindsey Scott, who's been through been through this program for a few years now, and will be in his third year by then. Well, and what's crazy too is like with all the consternation and everything that was going on last year, LSU still finishes fourth in S and P plus despite the eight and four record. And you mentioned those those late finishes in the Auburn game, and you know even in even in the Wisconsin game too, and the Alabama game for all intents and purposes was a ten point game. If LSU bumps their offense up from where it was last year and it finished 22nd in S&P and they get to like, say, 10 to 13, somewhere around there, what's the ceiling for this team? And then what's what's a reasonable expectation for them in 2017? Well, this is a team that's going to be favored in probably almost every game it plays in with the exception of one, and that's Alabama. And, and at the end of the day, that's what it comes down to is you can be really, really good and you've got to get over – that big giant crimson hump that has the best coach of maybe all time and more talent than everybody else in this conference in front of you. And it, it's been that way for the last five seasons. You know, I, I going back to the, the, the first big game of the century in, in 2011, I remember telling people it's, it's entirely possible that one of these teams is the second best team in the country and also the second best team in its division. And they both can't win. Little did we know that LSU would win and then be told that it really didn't count because they missed the field goal and uh, have to play Alabama again, which I think was still bogus, but whatever. Either way, since that, that time, that's what that's been the stakes. And in, in almost every year, even in this year, LSU's never been out of the division race when they play Alabama. They've been in a position where if they can just find a way to win that game, maybe they can they can sneak sneak into Atlanta or something like that and you know we'll just have to see what happens this year it, it, it's it's still going to be a tough schedule for a team that that loses a lot of starters and is going to be somewhat inexperienced but it's still going to have enough talent to navigate it if thing you know if they can catch the right breaks there's there's going to be some tough road games on there but you know we'll just have to see what happens all right final one before i get you out of here for the staff at ATVS are they more excited when LSU plays in the Superdome or are they more excited when WrestleMania comes to the Superdome like it does <laughs> next year? Oh, well, I, I think most of us are going to we'll 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 stay with LSU. There's a few there's a few holdouts on on the wrestling mm-hmm. thing. You know, some <laughs> of our, our our mainstream columnists are are hold out, holdouts there, but but for those of us and I mean, shoot, this will be my third WrestleMania, so it's almost old hat for me at this point. Uh but, you know, it's always more about national championship. That's something that's truly special and, and something that having had it ripped away a couple of years ago, you know, we, it makes you appreciate it that much more. Well, LSU certainly has the talent, would expect them to be in the hunt once again and in the coming years. Billy, I want to thank you for joining me. If you want to catch any of Billy's work, you can do so at andthevalleyshook.com. If you want to find him on Twitter, you can do so at ATVS underscore Chef Billy. They also have a site podcast as well, which you can check out either on SoundCloud or on iTunes. If you search Sneaky Good Podcast, you can find all of that stuff. And like we talked about at the beginning too, they're not just football. They're baseball too. They cover basketball. They do all that good stuff. They love their sports at LSU. And Billy, want to thank you for joining me. And, uh, Appreciate you talking about LSU football. No problem. Hey, anytime. Thanks for having me. There you have it. Once again, want to thank Billy Gomilla for joining the show. Be sure to check out all of his work 
on Twitter at ATVS underscore Chef Billy, and then everything that Anne the Valley Shook does by going to Anne the Valley Shook dot com and checking out their podcast, the Sneaky Good Podcast. LSU is going to be a very interesting team to watch this season, particularly along the offensive side of the ball. If Matt Canada is able to get at least consistent play out of Danny Etling, you can definitely make the case that LSU should be in the race for the SEC West, at the very least, heading into that Alabama game late in the season. Uh, as Billy mentioned, we know what Darius Geis is going to do. I think the receiver play maybe right now is, is a little bit of an unknown, but LSU always certainly has talent there. So I think the offense should be at least a little more consistent than it has been in prior years. And then it's hard to not think that the defense is going to be very good despite losing all of the talent that they lost to the NFL this past offseason just because you know that there are former four- and, and five-star blue-chip type players there. And when you're working with a guy like Dave Aranda, a defensive coordinator, it's pretty hard not to have a very good defense. So LSU going to be, I think, solid once again. And as Billy alluded to, if a couple, a couple of breaks go their way, then – it, this is definitely a team that should be in the SEC title discussion near the end of the season. And as always, it's going to come down to that game against Alabama. I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode of the Two Stripes podcast. Once again, I want to thank Billy for joining the show. If you guys want to help out the show, please go to iTunes, search Two Stripes podcast, leave a five star review, leave any sort of review. Give me feedback on what you want to hear from the show, how I can make things better. It's greatly appreciated. And then you can go on your computer as well, soundcloud.com slash two stripes pod, download, listen, all that good stuff from there and interact with the show. Interact with me. I rarely give out my Twitter account because I don't know why you would want to follow me. But if you do, you can do so on Twitter at dubsco. That's D-U-B-S-C-O on Twitter. That's it for this week's show, though. I'll be back next week with another episode of the Two Stripes Podcast. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you then.